Hi. All right, let's press play. But there's a problem. Uh, most people think that playing video games is a trivial waste of time. Even my parents, who made a living out of selling video games back in the 90s, well, they also thought that playing video games was pretty much a waste of time. Though most people disregard the act of playing video games, the fact is that virtual experiences feel real, and they can stir profound emotions and behaviors. Think about it. When we play video games, you can live the life of a different character, like becoming an Italian plumber called Mario. OK, <laughs> or Luigi. Or you can visit worlds that defy our imagination, like the dreamlands in Final Fantasy. Today, I would like to talk about three ways in which video games can profoundly affect our emotions and behaviors. First, I would like to talk about how, in video games and in virtual environments, the cape makes the superhero. How playing video games can also lead to virtual persuasion effects. And finally, I would like to talk about some concrete applications of this knowledge. Like, for example, can we get gamers to exercise more after they play the video game? <laughs> Tough call. <laughs> People change depending on their external appearance. Psychologists use the term and cloth cognition to refer to how we change based on the clothes that we are wearing. Some clothes make us feel cool or uncool or powerful and in control or even, depending on what we're wearing, powerless and even awkward. Kids seem to be very much aware of this effect. This must not leave the room, but I was that kid, that kid, that was always wearing costumes, all day, every day. Perhaps in an attempt to live my life as if I was a different character with superpowers. No researcher has demonstrated this effect any better than Bugs Bunny and Elmer Fudd. Uh, anyone remember those characters? All right. Um, in one episode, this truck full of theatrical props tilts over, and all of these costumes come flying out in the air. Elmer Fudd is chasing Bugs Bunny, but the characters start to switch roles depending on what clothes they're wearing, like a soldier's helmet, or a pilgrim's hat, or a gangster outfit. And hilarity ensues from this constant role reversal in which the hunted becomes the hunter and vice versa. Something like this also happens in games and virtual environments. For example, we invited participants to have online discussions, and all we did there is to have half of them to wear avatars or a virtual self dressed in black, and the other half of the participants were just using avatars dressed in black, in white, I'm sorry. Uh, interestingly enough, the participants that were using avatars dressed in black became a little bit more assertive, a little bit more aggressive in these online discussions. But when you would ask the participants, they didn't know that this was actually happening, that they were becoming more assertive and a little bit more aggressive. Colleagues have also shown this effect by, for example, having people use avatars or a virtual persona in a virtual environment that would be taller than what you really are as a way to boost confidence. And researchers nowadays are also looking at how character choice in popular games like, for example, World of Warcraft and League of Legends is associated not only to specific in-game behaviors, but how character choice is associated to the behaviors that people enact outside of the game. Researchers may not necessarily agree on what to call these effects, but we all can agree that in virtual environments, the cape makes the superhero. 
In what other ways do virtual experiences matter? Let me give you one example. Back in 2008, and also in 2012, President Obama bought ads, put advertisements in popular car racing games, but also in games like, for example, the very popular Madden NFL franchise. That begs the question, can virtual experiences affect the way that people shop online or even vote for a political candidate? Design features in virtual environments appear to have persuasive effects. Like, for example, seeing an avatar that looks like you in a virtual environment endorsing a product can also lead people to prefer that product also in real life. Seeing an avatar that looks like you in a virtual environment get older can get people to start saving more money as a way to prepare for the future. What about my President Obama example? Well, we also know that in virtual contexts, sometimes when the game is going too fast, people may not have enough mental capacity to remember the ads. So, in regards to President Obama's ads, if they were placed in a virtual environment that was too fast-paced, then people might have not been persuaded. But let's go back to my previous example of people becoming older in a virtual environment. Uh, in a recent study, what we did is to have young people, like many of you today in the audience, use older avatars or young avatars. Interestingly enough, Participants that were using an older avatar behaved like older people while they were shopping online. There was a three-second delay when people were using older avatars and were walking around this virtual store. They just walked more slowly. <laughs> more interestingly, young people using older avatars selected products that were marketed towards older people, while younger people using young avatars pre prefer products, as you might expect, that were marketed towards younger people. In addition to this, what about persuasion in the context of violent video games? Well, it turns out that violent video game context might not be the, w the best return of investment. It may just not work. Uh, violence is not only distressful, but it is also distracting. For example, we had our participants go through a virtual environment and see all of these brands like Konami, Nintendo, EA, etc. But in the violent context, they remember fewer of these brands in comparison to people to, that went through a similar virtual environment that did not feature this aggressive information. It appears that violence depletes our cognitive resources to process some of these ads, and overall, it might be that advertising in violent games is perhaps not an advisable strategy, not only from a moral standpoint, but also from a return on of investment standpoint. In what other ways can we use this knowledge? In what other ways can we use these vir virtual persuasive effects? For example, can we get gamers to exercise more depending on their virtual experiences? Well, recent studies have shown something really interesting. For example, seeing yourself lose weight or gain weight in a virtual environment can get people to exercise more, at least temporarily perhaps in an attempt to reach, uh, to reach that virtual weight loss ideal, or perhaps to compensate for seeing yourself getting a little bit chunkier in a virtual environment. Most people assume that gamers are couch potatoes, but that's not necessarily the case. Here's another example of this. Here at UC Davis, we tried the following. We invited our participants to play Wii Tennis. Anybody here has ever played Wii Tennis? Okay, so you would know that you would use the motion controller as if it was a racket, and you would play Wii Tennis as more or less the same way as you play regular tennis. 
we hooked our participants to motion trackers that would measure their behaviors as they were actually playing the game. So we attach a motion tracker on their wrist and another motion tracker on participants' waist. And we gave our participants this type of avatars. Half of our participants used a thin avatar, and half of our participants used a more obese avatar for themselves. And as when they were playing the game, they played against the AI that would be represented with a thin or an obese avatar. The expectation here was that when seeing your avatar as a fit, thin athlete, that that would remind you of agility, and that when seeing your own avatar as a more obese, as a chunkier avatar, that that may remind people of sluggishness. Interestingly enough, people move more in real life when they were playing this game when having the thin avatar as opposed to the obese avatar. We were able to replicate replicate this effect in both a sample of males and female participants. It worked the same way. This virtual influence worked on both males and females. But what about one's real self? Well, we were very surprised that people's own body mass index their BMI did not affect the results. It might be that people get so immersed in the virtual environment that at least temporarily, that virtual self becomes more important than one's real self. When playing the game with a slim avatar against a slim opponent, people move the most. This might be a social comparison effect. When you see yourself in a virtual environment as a fit avatar and you see your opponent also as a fit avatar, it might be that people move more in real life to increase their odds of winning. Overall, the design features of virtual environments are nothing but trivial. Virtual experiences not only feel real, but they can temporarily affect the thoughts, emotions, and behaviors of people that play games. We should harness this knowledge, not only to make our lives a little bit more fun and entertaining, but also to make all of those virtual moments count for something bigger. I would like to give thanks tonight to some of the students working in my laboratory. Some of them might be here tonight. Janath Gasnavi, Subuhi Khan, Cassie Alexopoulos, Micah Yee, and Andrew Cobb. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>